Thank you for the opportunity to uh, share together this morning, and we do pray that you would be with us as we examine a little bit about ourselves and uh, the, the sin that has crept into our lives that separates us from you, and we just pray that uh, we will see the hope that, that comes because of, of your great love for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I don't know why it's not on the phone. Well, no need to worry about it. Uh, the only thing we don't have on there is the origin of sin. So, um, what is the origin of Satan? Who could tell me the origin of Satan? Lucifer was. <clears throat> Out of okay, that's the uh, the common conception is that an angel by the name of Lucifer was in heaven and he led a rebellion and got kicked out. Uh, number one, the reference to Lucifer as being Satan is not an accurate statement because it refers to uh, Jews in Isaiah and it's really up in the air as so whether it's is talking about Satan or an actual person here upon the earth. And my problem that I've always had is how would Satan rebel against God? If you're in heaven, um, how do you rebel against God um, and think that you're going to win? Now, when you think about Satan, do you think about someone who is smart or someone who is dumb? Smart. Very smart. Cunning. Very smart. Cunning. He wouldn't do anything really stupid. Now, if you are an angel and you've got God who created you and God who is all powerful and God who is all the things we've talked about, how smart would it be to try to lead a rebellion against that God? Uh, I mean, you know, we make God out to be, or we make Satan out to be so smart, and yet there are a lot of things that we say that he did or does, and it's really kind of dumb. He was full of pride. He was full of pride. Uh, and again, uh, you know, that, uh, we get that from other scriptures. My theory is that you can, you know, however you want to do this, You've got Satan rebelling in heaven. You've got Satan as being one of the angels. We don't really know what his angelic name was. Uh, I do not like Lucifer, and more and more people, I think, are moving away from Lucifer as being that. But the majority of people, you know, still hold to that. Uh, but my idea is that Satan, the angels were created when God created um man when he created the universe because what does the name angel mean messenger what? messenger messenger and so if you're going to be a messenger you got to have someone to message to and so uh, there would have been no need for angels before or at least they would have been called angels so when god created the the heavens and the earth and he created man he created angels to to be the messengers to them. So they're a part of that creation. It's not mentioned as far as the uh, the six days, but it was it was all a part of that. And at this point then, Satan does lead a rebellion, but it is a smart rebellion because he believes he can win. So how can you defeat God? If you prove God to be unholy, you have an opportunity to defeat God because you make him less than God. Now, I'm not saying Satan was a genius from a standpoint of having it all figured out, but uh, there was at least a plan whereby if he could get, um, if, if he could and somehow prove God to be unholy, and even if he proved man to be unholy, at least he would get them. And so there would be the opportunity uh, of having 
uh, having man, because if God wipes them out, then he, the accusation would be that he asked man to do something that was impossible to do. And so all he's got to do is get man to sin, and then he makes that accusation to, uh, before God. Um, so, in the garden, when it talks about Satan coming to, or when it talks about uh, the serpent tempting Adam and Eve, I believe it's possible that that is the angelic name of, uh, of Satan, is serpent. Because the Adam's name is man with an article in front of it, and that changes it from man to the man or Adam, making it a proper name. The same article is used in front of serpent when it, in Genesis chapter 3 when it says the serpent. And so that very well could be an angelic name. Um, when you think about life in the garden, and you think about God having fellowship and walking in the cool of the day, and you think about angels being messengers, um, is it too much to think that the angels may have interacted with Adam and Eve? And so when you have serpent, one of the archangels coming and talking to Adam and Eve, it would not be strange at all. But I'm telling you, if a snake started talking to me, uh, that would be strange. Now, there's all sorts of ideas about the, uh, the talking snake and the idea that the, uh, the snake had legs and was up in the tree. Um, you, don't have to, you don't have to buy into all that. Uh, I know a lot of good, uh, conscientious people do, and they, you know, the idea is that, uh, that that was the curse that God put upon uh, the snake, and that's why he crawls around on his belly. There is some evidence that there would not even have been snakes in the garden because they would not have been uh, a part of the of animals that would have been in the garden as opposed to animals that were outside the garden. So, at least that's a possibility that the uh, that the rebellion of Satan what took place in the garden, and not only was it the fall of man, but it was the fall of Satan. I'm just saying that that's my theory. I'm holding to it. I've uh, held it for a long time. Now, whatever you believe, the origin of sin goes back to Satan. Somewhere along the line, Satan rebelled against God. And then he now tempts man to rebel against God. Um, and the idea being, if he gets every human being to sin then it is impossible for man to be all that God wanted him to be. And so God asked man to do something that was impossible. God is therefore unholy. That's the accusation. You believe it, that well, what God's going to do with that or not, but at least in Satan's mind, he's got that possibility. So what does that mean? And we're getting a little ahead of ourselves a, a bit. When Jesus is here upon the earth, what's he got to do? Sin. He's got to get Jesus to sin. A, if he gets Jesus to sin, he still has that accusation. B, if he doesn't get uh, Jesus to sin, then God says, no, Jesus did it. And so your accusation is wrong, which means that that is the time at which Satan is now kicked out of heaven, no longer has access that he appears to have had in the book of Job. So... That's why when Jesus was here, he would have uh, really caused more havoc for Jesus than any other person upon the face of the earth. So anyway, uh, you got to get sin here somewhere. God didn't create sin. God is not the origin of sin. Uh, but it is Satan who was one of his angels who rebelled, who led a rebellion uh, in heaven. And it appears that a third of the angels went with him. Uh, we don't know all the details with regard to that. And I don't know that you need to know all the details. As Kiva keeps reminding us, we don't know everything. We know enough. And so um, we know that, that Satan 
brought sin, and when sin came into the world, um, now man's got to deal with sin. So, what is sin? Now we go back to the, the uh, paper on the board. Um, there are basically two words or two ideas of sin that are put forth as far as scripture is concerned. Um, I wish I were better at pronounce, pronouncing Greek words. I wish my wife were here because she does a much better job. But the first one means breaking the rules and the second one means missing the mark. Okay, an example of that as far as scripture is concerned. Breaking of the rules is in Matthew 15, 3. Jesus replied, and why do you break the commands of God for the sake of your tradition? And so he uses the, the word para, parabasis, and it means breaking the rules, breaking the commands of God. So that is what sin is is breaking the rules of God. It is rebelling. It is doing something that God said not to. God said, don't eat of the fruit. Adam and Eve ate the fruit. It also means missing the mark. And God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Uh, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left sins committed beforehand unpunished. Whoops. Okay. But it left sins, missing the mark, committed beforehand unpunished. So it's not just the idea that we rebel against God, but we have also now missed the mark. We've missed the mark of holiness. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We fall short of the protection or the perfection of God. So uh, sin is is rebelling against God, doing something that God has said not to do, and it is the idea of missing the mark and not being holy. And so the reality is once you have rebelled once, you're going to come up short. You're not going to be perfect. And so therein lies uh, the sin. So what is the result of sin? Results uh, in the separation from God for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in uh, Christ Jesus our Lord. So, result of sin, separation from God. Once we have sinned, once we've missed the mark, once we are no longer holy, we cannot be in fellowship, in relationship with God. That's just the way things are. Um... It's, it's not unfair because God is the one who has created us and God is the one who is holy. That's just who he is. He's holy. And so if we're not holy, then we cannot be in relationship with God. And so everything as far as uh, the world got turned upside down when Adam and Eve sinned because now they're separated from God. They have to be put away from God. God can't have that same fellowship with them. And so this isn't something that, that we ought to look at, well, you know, God should be able to overlook it. God is perfect. God is holy. This is something that God cannot overlook. It is impossible. And if he could, and if he did, then he would no longer be God. And so when we, when we think about sin, we got to think about it, it's a pretty big deal. When we sin... We are no longer perfect. We're no longer holy. We are no longer able to have fellowship with God. So if we think that we're, well, we're pretty good, and so God should like us, and let us, you know, um, we can do that with people. You know, we admit we're not perfect, and so, you know, we don't have to have perfect friends. Uh, people can be like us, and, and we can still like them. So, you know, Glenn has trouble going because he thinks he's really good. No, I'm just kidding. But, you know, you, you know people who are like that. I mean, they think that they're up here and you got to reach up to that standard. Well, even those people have a few people that reach up to that standard. And all of us, 
from time to time have looked at people who don't quite reach our standard and we may not and, and that's not right because we are all sinners this is not God you know being anything but God he is holy we can't understand it because we can't understand holiness but, but God is stuck in a way because even if he loves us and wants to he can't because we sin okay um, so the separate and as far as the in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned they were separated they brought our death came into the world uh, because they had to be separated so they could die physically the punishment actually was spiritual death it was actually that that separation uh, immediate separation they immediately didn't have the fellowship that they had, had before things were different um, so um, are there degrees of sin I always like this discussion because it's really getting people fired up sometimes. Are you going to get fired up on me? <laughs> Are there degrees of sin? Or is one sin just as bad as another? The worst sin is denying God exists. <clears throat> what? The worst sin is denying God exists. Okay, the worst sin is God denying God exists. So we do have degrees of sin. Because that's, if that's the worst sin, then there are some sins that are worse than others. Some sins that God hates. There are sins that God hates. Again, that would point that there is a degree of sin. There's an unpardonable sin, and that's the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. If you get that figured out, we'll give you a class session to, to explain that too, but that's a toughie. So, how many think there are degrees of sin? Oh, we don't want to raise our hand on that one. How many think one sin is just as bad as another? I'm the only one. But you just said that there are seven sins that God hates. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. Uh, and see, that's the, the, uh, the discussion that you have. Uh, I, I usually say, you know, as far as degrees of sin, um, I think Robin would say that there would be degrees of sin from a standpoint of if I would tell her that I went out to dinner with a, uh, an old girlfriend, it would be a whole lot better than if I told her that we went to a hotel. With a, oh, there she comes. I, was, I thought I was talking without her there. Yeah, I think she would rather think that I just went to dinner as opposed to go to a hotel. It's man makes it on the levels of sin. What? It's man who makes different levels of sin. Man who makes different levels of sin? But it's not God. Yeah. For he doesn't say you need salvation only if you've done these sins. I mean, these lower ones, you're okay. Okay. Um, we'll leave it and let's talk about a couple other things here. Um, the first thing that, that happens because we sin is we are guilty. And we stand guilty before God and so we need to be made right. And so when we start talking about salvation, we talk in terms of justification. Somehow something has to happen. So that we can be justified, we can be made right, and and so uh, it takes away the guilt of sin. In that sense, any time that you sin, you are guilty before God, and so there is no degree of sin. One sin is bad as another. As far as our separation from God is concerned, as far as our guilt is concerned. However... We're also sick. When we sin, it makes us sick, meaning that um, we want to sin more. 
And so that's why, as far as salvation is concerned, it talks in terms of sanctification. You know, we, we it's not good. It's not just enough for God to say, "Okay, you're you're justified." Uh, it's just like you've never sinned. But we still got this sickness. We still got this disease that we want to continue to sin. And so we've got to work on uh, that area of sanctification. There's where the the degrees of sin come in, and not so much degrees of sin, but degrees of sickness. If you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you that you have a cold, isn't that a whole lot better than if he goes and says you have pneumonia? You're still sick. I mean, you're sick, sick. And so you're sick. But there are degrees of being sick. You can have a cold, a hangnail, or you can have pneumonia, or the virus. And even the virus has a whole lot of different levels of, of whatever there as well. So therein is the conflict when we're talking about are there degrees of sin? <clears throat> In the sense that as far as our guilt is concerned, no. One sin, you're guilty. But as far as our sickness is concerned, that's going to change. That's going to vary. And, and so we do need to be concerned about, um, about our sickness and as far as what we do. So you understand the distinction. No, there isn't, but yes, there is. There's no distinction from a standpoint of sin because we're guilty. As far as sins, the acts that we commit because of that sin, yes, there are, there are degrees. There are differences. And um, I think both are important to understand. You know, we can't get pride because, well, I don't do such and so and such and so and such and so. Well, you're still guilty. But on the other hand, we need to evaluate ourselves from a standpoint of our relationship with God because of what we're willing to do. And not to judge others, but to judge ourselves. You know, I, I, I still need to work on this. You know, I haven't killed anyone lately, but man, um, if murder would become legal, I got two or three people at the top of my list. I hope nobody in here. I was going to say, I think he's looking at me. Yeah. Keevan works at it sometimes. Though. So, so God looks at our heart to see how we deal with our sin, whether we want to continue overlooking and continue doing what we know he doesn't like, or whether we try harder and ask the Lord to help us to overcome these areas that we need work on and that's how, he, that's how he is going to deal with us as far as helping us get better. That has nothing to do with how he looks at us as far as whether or not we're guilty or not guilty. Right. Because there is nothing about us. We can't earn it. No, there's nothing about us we can earn it. There's nothing about us that God looks at and says, oh, you know, keep us getting, getting better. So, yeah, we might want to move him up the... It has nothing to do with with him looking at Keevan, or me, or Glenn, or anyone. I mean, you know, we're going to get to a point where we got to understand it's not us. It is not us, because we are sinners. We are unholy, and we are <laughs> trying to approach a holy God. Okay. Uh, the biggie. Where does sin come into our lives? Are we born in sin? Or do we have original sin? A couple of verses. For in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And therefore just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way, death came to all people because all sin. Are we born sinners? If you are born 
and you die before you reach the age of one day, are you a sinner bound for hell? The born a sinner, but they have not sinned yet. If you're born a sinner, you're gone to hell. You're guilty. If you are born a sinner, you are guilty. If you are guilty, you're gone to hell. Or you're separated from God. Sin is a willful act. So a child is not sinless because they have made the decision to do wrong. This is a big dilemma as far as the religious world is concerned. Because a majority of Protestant theology in its origin is that we are born in sin. Why do you think churches practice infant baptism? Because it takes away that sin. I mean, they accuse us of thinking that, you know, that we believe that you're only saved by baptism, and, and they're the ones who practice infant baptism uh, from a standpoint of um, taking away sin. And um, so, as you're trying to put together your theology, this has to come into it. And if you are, um, if you believe in, in original sin, then, and the fact that you were born in sin, then you got to deal with babies who haven't sinned. Or babies who don't know. And how are you going to deal with all that? Okay. The world is... <clears throat> Adam and Eve was created in a perfect world. They were given the ability, choice, to sin. They were adults when they sinned. They weren't infants. A baby is born sinless. And they don't commit sin until they have knowledge of sin and know they've done wrong. And, and that's, you know, that's what I believe. But again, that's not what the majority of Protestant theology believes or teaches. Um, they, they may make some um, provision for babies somehow or, or children somehow. And I'm not sure how they do it. I mean, that's the whole thing that, um, that's difficult for me to understand. Um, but... It is, um, if you believe in original sin, you have a problem with anyone up until the point that um, they can be saved. Um, Are children under the protection of the parent till they're at the age of accountability? No? Uh, there's nothing in scripture that teaches that. Is that what Jesus meant, perhaps, when he said, lest you become as a little child? Well, I think that is one of the scriptures that I would go to from a standpoint of saying that little children are still innocent. So that you're not born in sin. They're not held accountable for that sin. Um, but, you know, at what point does a child become accountable? And, again, we have a tendency, and I don't know why we do this, we want to know the, all the particulars, and, and so um, a, a child, at what point do they cross that line from the age of accountability, and up until this point they're okay, and then they cross over. Uh, that's going to be one of the problems that you have if you don't believe they're born in sin. It's easy, if you're born in sin, it starts at birth. Um, or even it starts a conception, really. Um, but when you're, you know, the idea that they, they have to willfully make that choice, um, I think our God is big enough to be able to look at the hearts of, of people and there is a, an area there where a child knows enough to accept, but not necessarily to be accountable. And I don't know how, and that's not in scripture, that's Dave Underwood's theory. Uh, after dealing with kids 
you know, for so many years as to how, because, you know, um, if, you, if you don't believe a five or six year old kid who wants to get baptized, well, do they know enough? And if you baptize them when they're five or six, it's just like infant baptism, but they don't understand enough. And so they go through all life thinking they've been baptized when in reality they weren't. Or even you get it on seven or eight. It really gets, if, if we want to, we can make things really tough for ourselves. But if we leave some of this stuff in God's hands, we're, we're a whole lot better off. And that's kind of what I've done is, is from a standpoint, when, when children come, I want to make sure that they understand enough. I want to make sure they understand that they are sinners from a standpoint that, of what sin is. But whether God is going to kind of, yeah, because then you're dealing with this fine line, okay? This day, uh, I you know, come all the way up here and I'm okay. And then the next day I wake up and all of a sudden I sin and now I'm condemned to hell. I don't think God has those fine lines that we want to draw. Uh, when you cross over, you're doomed. Now, the only reason I can say that is what we've got coming later. Because it's not because I think so or because, you know, I want to think that way. Because the, the sin problem is not something that we have solved ourselves. The sin problem is something that God has solved. But the whole idea then of, uh, of sin is that we all are separated from God, we all are guilty, we all are sick, and we, can do not, we can't do anything to change our situation. So, um, with the idea of original sin and going back that way, I don't believe that it's there. I think children are born innocent. Um, there are, are three components to that. One believes the innocent or um, guilty. And then there's a, the other, the idea that they're innocent, but they are polluted and uh, are corrupt. Um, I think the fact that they were born into a sinful world is pollution enough. I mean, we teach them an awful lot of uh, about sin just by, by the way that we way that we act and I mean they're they're living in sin um, I think an the, example would be you take a little two year old and say share that with your little sister and he says no I mean where did he learn that already and it see, has to be there and see that goes back to the idea that that's what people say they're born in sin they have sin they, you know, they're sinners I mean, he didn't sin, but... Oh, if you believe in original sin, they do. <laughs> that, that, it's there, you know. I, I hate it when I hear little, you know, when the parents say, well, they're just little sinners. <laughs> it's obvious that, you know, it, it's, it, you know, it's there. And where did they learn that? And is it a sin to them when... We teach them that sometimes. I mean, you know, we say it's mine. Don't touch that. You know, don't touch the TV, don't touch the stove. We're doing it for their protection, but they haven't processed all that. All you're doing is you're saying that's mine, don't touch it. So if I got something, I can say the same thing. They don't understand what they're saying. God created us from the time we were born to develop and to change and, and grow. And I think until you change and grow to the point where you realize you're doing wrong, you're, you're innocent. Now there are some situations where the parents aren't good parents and the children, you're gonna, you know, my child plays with him and mine's good, he's not. But that's not the child's fault until he realizes that he has done wrong somewhere along the way. But God made us, and he, you know, he put that pattern in us to develop and to learn, grow. The, uh, 
the real hang up here in, in deciding whether we are born in sin or not born in sin is not even so much this situation um, as it is um, what comes from this. Um, because the theology that is born from original sin has the practice of infant baptism. When we lost our baby, um, he was born in a Methodist hospital, and the nurse came and said, do you want this baby, you want the baby baptized? And I said something that she probably thought was the most uncruel thing in the world. I said, no, she doesn't need to be. Well, to me, she hadn't sinned, so she didn't need to be. To her, oh, she's not gonna go to heaven or hell, she's not worth anything, so yeah. I don't know what she thought, but you know, that was, that was my reaction uh, to that. And so that is, that's when it comes, uh, where the rubber meets the road with regard to your theology, because um, the restoration movement began with Alexander Campbell, uh, Thomas Campbell, and uh, Barton W. Stone. When Alexander Campbell had babies, and he had been preaching against this idea of original sin, that's where the rubber met the road. Is he going to baptize his baby? Because if you you know you don't, and they die, they're going to hell. And see, again, that's why you have a problem, you know, if you believe in original sin and you baptize babies and, and people who, who have been sprinkled think that that was their baptism, but they had nothing to do with choosing that. And so that's why we believe in adult baptism, because it has to be the person who accepts and, and makes that decision. So like I say, the, I, this, this talking about original sin is, is the basis for a lot of other things that are going to come up as far as theology is concerned you, you know you, you got to come to grips with that uh, as opposed to you know as to what you really think what you believe and I believe what the Bible teaches I do not believe that the Bible teaches that we are born in sin Adam brought sin into the world yes and whatever Adam brought Jesus took away and so that's the, the, the promise that we have. Um, obviously, sin came when Adam and Eve sinned, and death came because they got put out of the garden. So we'll kind of go from there. Okay, I got uh, a quarter after. We got a little late start, and we're at, at, a, at a good point to, to break. I need to double check and see if I got... Well, it's a good thing I am done. I guess so. Well. <laughs> what did you do? I must have, I don't know. It makes me, if I clicked, oh, Glad. If I click, if I click don't save on my PowerPoint, am I in trouble? No. You already saved. Already saved I already saved all that, but I didn't save the new stuff. I got I had all the Jesus stuff on PowerPoint, I thought. All right. Let's pray and add a prayer that I saved it somehow. <laughs> Father, we just uh, thank you again for the salvation that we have. Uh, we left us at a pretty dark place. Uh, we're, we're sinners. We're guilty. We're sick. We have no way of saving ourselves. And so we, uh, we put our, ourselves in your hand. But we know that there is an answer. We know that Jesus came and that uh, salvation comes through him. In his name we pray. Amen.